we saw some some analysis of the market here within our region. Only about 30% of adults are computer literate in, in all segments, but about 55% of kids coming out of high school are. Yeah. So if you look at the the buyer user of the future, all this is really done with the Nintendo is it's it started them from an earlier age instead of their first exposures at varying levels of school depending on the economic conditions to preschool. Yeah. So they're already attuned to it. When they get to school, they're, they're ready to learn and use the technology faster. And when they get out of school, uh, they're, they're gonna de their demand for the services, the access, the capabilities is going to be far higher than what their parents were. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Children, children have enormous force in the market. It's very little understood, but the the point was is that out of all the computers that have been sold, and all of this, and all the hype we have about personal computers, the most populous computer was called into being <laughs> by these children, and I suspect out of their deep, deep hunger for a quality of responsiveness that doesn't exist anywhere else. And while we criticize it about, you know, uh, the syndrome that are going to happen to their knuckles, and I agree with that. And what's going to happen to their eyeballs if they spend four hours a day in front of the television set? And I agree with that. And what might happen to them psychologically if they keep playing Rambo games? And I agree with that. But I don't think it's got anything to do with that, the point that I really want to get at. It has to do with how these things engage them, right? How it kind of nourishes their desire to be in this kind of response relationship with something else in the world, which is the nature of how they are inside themselves at another level. So, having said that, putting Nintendo on the side, and, and I, the other testimony in my personal experience is what I was showing you, the radar helper in Darren. I mean, he invented all of this in a way. He said, I want to make a multi, in my language, I want to have a multimedia magnifying glass that I can point at anything I want to, ask whatever question I want to, and get visual images and sounds and all this stuff. And he was five years old, and he didn't know any about, anything about my work. We talk about learning, but we don't talk about it theoretically. We, talk, we would just be doing it together, right? But out of, out of just being together and just the nature of being five years old, he invented something. And again, I think he speaks right to the core, archetypally, of what children want. They want to be able to follow through with their curiosities and their uncertainties. And that when it comes back to what we were talking about before, about how is it that somebody really starts to become a self-generating learner, at some level, it's because they've instrumented the fluctuation of uncertainty. They've instrumented, they've tuned in to artistically and mechanically what, it, what happens when they're curious, their own desires. When, when, when they're reading along or they're listening to you and all of a sudden they start to feel themselves drop because you're not making sense, they go, wait a minute. Because they could feel the drop. Well, we can't. How many people here have read a book in the past you know, week or two even, right? And you were interested and motivated and you're tracking along, right? And then all of a sudden, you kind of, you find yourself waking up and you've turned a page or two, or certainly scanned through a paragraph or two, and you're going, where have I been? I know my eyes have gone through this stuff, but I wasn't home, <coughs> right? Anybody not had that experience? Well, how does that happen? Have you ever asked yourself, well, how the heck does that happen? It's okay if you're reading a book, you can drive a car and stay there. It can be real dangerous driving a car. <laughs> I'll wake up 10 miles down the road if that's how I got there. <laughs> driving a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of I-20 I've missed. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God for automatic pilots, huh? <laughs> but. The point, I guess, is that it's right at those points. If we talked about somebody who was becoming learning oriented, somebody learning oriented would recognize that they were falling out. And I don't have time to go into it, but I have an entire exposition on what I call the cycles of engagement and how attention disengages, how attention erodes, primarily because when children feel uncertain and curious, which are kind of instrumenting the impulse level we were talking about earlier in their bodies about walking. When they do that up in knowledge space or in mediation through words and what have you, they can't follow through on it. 
So they tr they're trained as part of the process of learning to read and learning to relate to information and knowledge that certain frequency levels, certain levels of their uncertainties and curiosities are absolutely meaningless. No use following through on them at all. And that's what causes us to fall away. Because we're not on the edge of ourselves when we're learning. Now, what I want to say is, is that what we need to be do doing is developing an environment that calls somebody to be right on that edge, to instrument and tune their own uncertainties and their curiosities, because there's nothing more relevant to how they can proceed than how well they can instrument that. Take critical thinking on as an issue, critical awareness. What is critical awareness? What does being able to understand the process of abstraction or orders or classes or know the difference between what's just an alternative representation from what's an entirely different thing? Orders and classes and logical types and what is it that, that allows somebody to articulate a good, an authentic question? What is a question? I think a question, you know, is the articulation of uncertainty. Right? It's uncertainty given voice and language. But <clears throat> so if we see that in science, for example, the driving engine of science is an authentic question, not your question that I'm going to repeat, but you know, in the case of Newton sitting underneath the apple tree and saying, why doesn't the moon fall? It ought to fall. And living that question, right? I mean, becoming that question becomes alive. Well, how does a question become alive? I mean, it's because these people were able to take what was a, the spark of uncertainty and recognize the significance of their own uncertainty, recognize the significance of their own curiosity, and instrument and tune it and know that that was a valuable thing. That was the, those are the flashlights they have to go into the cave, are these impulses, these capacities. So seeing the need, going back to where we were, for uh, development of learners, that businesses want it, that education's evolving that way, and that that means becoming capacity-oriented. And that capacities require, really aren't about reading, writing, and arithmetic, but are about uncertainty, about attention span, about desire, curiosity, um, disambiguation, the ability to, to hang in ambiguity, to be able to um, realize that where you're frustrated is your greatest learning opportunity. Right? These things are the ground, the fountains of the kind of phenomenological learning capacities that we have. They underlie critical thinking skills. They're the source. At some level, there's some interface between them and whatever it is that we're doing as we instrument ourselves and act in the world. So assuming that, that we were concerned with this, then the question becomes, what's the equivalent of a a gymnasium, and I want to use the metaphor of a Nautilus. Everybody's heard of a Nautilus machine. They're in every kind of workout joint in the world. So <clears throat> imagine an, a Nautilus, and instead of weights in the Nautilus machine, you put subject material. And the point isn't that we're going to become, the point isn't that I'm going to learn the subject. I'm going to learn the subject. But that the point is, is that I'm going, that subject is going to become the exercise environment for me to tune into this process. What would it look like? How would it work? That's the question that precedes the design of the technology that we've been working on. How do we build what I call a semnasium? Sem meaning meaning. Nasium meaning naked exercise, right? Where we exercise our own capacities, right? To differentiate and experience meaning. Which if you go into brain science, that's the core. What does the brain do? It constructs meaning, processes meaning. Yeah. Um,